Welcome to our Wednesday night service. Take your hymn books and stand. Turn to number 323. Number 323, Standing on the Promises of God. 323. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. And let's do that last verse, number four. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I am standing on the promises of God. And turn to 499, toward the hem, end of the hymn book there, number 499, Bringing in the Sheaves. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontide and the dewy. Waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Sowing in the sunshine, sowing in the shadows, fearing neither clouds nor winter chilling breeze. By and by the harvest and the labor ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Going forth and weeping, sowing for the master. Though the loss sustained, our spirit often grieves. When our weeping's over, he will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Amen. I hope you're standing on the promises tonight. If you're building on anything else in your life, it'll be unstable, and certainly you can build on the promises from God's Word, though, and have a solid life, a solid foundation to build upon, and of course, that's why we're here tonight. We want to build a little bit more in our Christian life, and I'm glad that you're here. Visitors, thanks for being here as well. We look forward to good service in the Lord. Uh, let's bow forward a prayer and ask God to meet with us to speak to our hearts tonight. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be in church on this Wednesday evening. Thank you for the people that are gathered together on this night to hear from you. Lord, I'd ask you, please speak to our hearts tonight. Feed us from your word, challenge us, grow us, encourage us, 
Do the work that you see needed in each one of our hearts and lives tonight, and we'll give you thanks for it. We thank you for the opportunity to sing your praises. Thank you that you've given us a book that we can build our lives upon. We ask all this in Christ Jesus' precious name. Amen. You could have a seat if you would. I have a few visitors tonight. I met Eric, Erica, correct, from Terre Haute. It's good to have you tonight. Thanks for being here. And then in the back, what's your name, ma'am? What is it? Barb. Good to have you, Barb. Thanks for being here. First time? Okay, good to have you. Any other visitors? Miss Angela, good to have your sister, uh, Audrey, with us. And uh, thanks for being with us tonight. Any other visitors that I'm missing? I think all the rest familiar faces. And Brother Chuck, if you wouldn't mind making sure we get a visitor packet into the hands of our visitors here tonight, that would be wonderful. You don't have any visitor packets? Oh, that's a problem. <laughs> Either one of you ladies know Spanish? <laughs> well, we'll get a visitor packet for you in just a minute. I apologize for that. Let me give you some announcements with, with what's going on at Bible Baptist. Uh, we have the Timothy class that meets this coming Sunday at 1 o'clock after the service. And our Brother Farr does a good job with that. If you have a desire to learn to preach, improve upon preaching in your life, uh, man, you're welcome to come be a part of that at 1 o'clock. And then please remember as well, uh, Dr. Bob Smith will be with us this coming week on, on Saturday, training uh, us as Sunday school teachers. If you're interested in teaching Sunday school in the future, uh, be there for that. If you're currently a Sunday school teacher, if you'd make sure to be there for that. I'm looking forward to having my tools sharpen and growing in uh, that area. So that's at Saturday or on Saturday from 5 till 7 and then on Sunday from 4 till 6. There'll be refreshments there for you as well and uh, we'll probably seek to have it upstairs here in the auditorium and that way people don't have to use stairs if they don't need to. Uh, then also coming up three on three basketball tournament uh, next Saturday. I can't believe that's upon us already. Be praying for that if you would. We have some teams signed up already for that tournament. We have a good group of workers signed up. If you plan on helping uh, for the three on three basketball tournament and have not signed up yet, if you'll get by the back table, uh, there is a sign up sheet for workers and we need your name on there before this weekend because before this weekend, we'll be putting together the list of where people are serving. And so make sure to see that board on your way out and uh, sign your name up for that if you would. And then, of course, be passing out flyers and be praying for that event that God would work in hearts and souls would be saved. I think those are all the announcements that we have for tonight. Uh, ushers, if you'll come at this time and we'll take up the offering this evening. I'll give you a report from Sunday. Had a good offering Sunday. We praise the Lord for that. Had in the general... 11,400, and so praise the Lord for a good offering there beginning of March. Uh, missions had a wonderful offering, and missions just shy of 5,000 for the week, and thank the Lord for that. Uh, VU, a little bit down. Uh, let's make sure we get in the building fund. I had 1,800 uh, for last week for VU, of course, start of a new month here in March, but let's be faithful to the Lord in our giving this evening. Brother Chavez, if you'll ask God's blessing on the offering tonight. Amen.
Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. That was good. Take your hymn books again. Turn to number 204, number 204, Nearer, Still Nearer. Still nearer, close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, so precious thou art. Fold me, oh, fold me close to thy breast. Shelter. Me say in that haven of rest, shelter me safe in that haven of rest, nearer still. as an offering to Jesus my King. Only my sinful heart grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Grant the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last, till safe in glory my anchor is cast. Sages have to be nearer, my Savior, still nearer to thee. Nearer, my Savior, still nearer to thee. I have a question. Uh, I don't know if there are many of you people realize or remember the water spigot that laid up here. It was kind of making a joke out of that to me. That water spigot is now in the ground. We're just waiting on water. <laughs> so we don't know if it's going to leak or not until we get the water. All right. The letter tonight is from the Global Baptist Church Planners. Sumanjapa, Odisha, India. And it starts out, Dear brethren, greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from Grace Bible Baptist Church. I thank God for enabling me to reach the unreached with the gospel of Juniper. We're around 21,000 people lives, live speaking two different languages. We are reaching both groups of people in two different congregations one in Juniper and the, another in the village of Gadiakola. <laughs> Sounds good to me. In these past few months, we have continued with Bible studies from the book of James for the believers. It has been a great blessing to all of us. God also enabled us to organize a gospel meeting in Juniper with our members and with visitors. One family and one young man trusted the Lord for salvation. There has been a man from Juniper, Juniper, who has always stood against us and the ministry. But thank God he has been attending our church services for the past two months. On the first Sunday that he came to church, he left before the service was finished. On the second Sunday, the man shared how God had spoken to him through his word and saved him. 
Also, three members have recently been baptized, and the members are going out and sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to people from different faiths and walks of life. Please pray with us for a church building for our branch church in Juniper. At present, we are having services in a small hut which cannot contain more people. Thank you for praying for our ministry and for your financial support. May God bless you. Yours in Christ, Schumann Jaffe. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, again for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, I thank you for every day that I'm able to wake up and open my eyes each morning, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for this church and what uh, you have been able to do through us, Lord, here. And I pray you'll continue to bless us and bless this special that's to come, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Chavez, ladies, what a blessing. In our Bibles this evening, we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4. What a blessing it is to be in God's house tonight, amen? I'm so glad to go to a place midweek, going through the work week. It gets tiring, it gets wearing at times, uh, but to go into God's house and receive encouragement from the brethren, uh, to be able to sing His praises hear good music sung. Thank you for all those that take part in the services on Sunday, on Wednesday, just to be a blessing to others, and then certainly just the right hand of fellowship with people that are gathered together at God's house. What a blessing. It's neat. It's exciting to see uh, the brick. How many saw a brick up on the front there? And uh, man, that's exciting to see brick finally out there. I'm, I'm excited for that to be done. We've been painting this week. Thank you. I uh, had a, a good number of men out Monday, had some men out Monday, then Tuesday, had a, just a, 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 seemed like a ton of men out there Tuesday night painting and got a lot done. 
And uh, hopefully tomorrow we'll see about finishing. If not tomorrow, then Friday, I think we'll knock it out. If there's a few people or even just one or two that are able to help out tomorrow. I know most, most men work during the day. If, if a guy has off, especially if he's younger and can move an arm a lot, uh, we could use a little bit of help tomorrow trying to knock that out. I think if we're able to, uh, to have that, we might knock it out tomorrow. We'll see how that goes. But pray for us as we finish up the painting and uh, just carry on with God's work. Painting in the building's not the main thing, amen? It's just a tool to do the main thing. And let's keep our eyes, of course, focused on the work that Christ has for us, getting the gospel out, seeing souls saved, baptized, and growing in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4 in our Bibles this evening, Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll read verse 11 to verse 14. Verse 11 through verse 14. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. We'll not go through tonight what all those offices uh, are that he's speaking of there. But then he says in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, and this will be our text verse for tonight, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And we're going to preach on the subject tonight, discerning truth from error, discerning truth from error. When Jesus was standing before Pilate, if you remember, at the uh, mockery of a trial that they gave to Jesus before they crucified him, Pilate asked the question, you remember, what is truth? He said, what is truth? And that's an important question. Think about that. What is truth? With so many different teachings today, with so many different religions, with so much uh, that, that veers different directions, the question has to be asked, what is truth? Now, Satan is a great counterfeiter. In fact, he's the greatest counterfeiter. Everything that God has ever created, has ever made, Satan has always made a counterfeit of that. Uh, God gave us a true faith, and Satan makes a counterfeit faith, and so on and so on with everything God has created. Um, everything that God has made, Satan takes and turns into a lie. And many times he'll take the truth, he'll twist it just slightly, just a little bit, and then he'll hand it back to man and say, go ahead, have at it. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't take a whole bunch of poison to kill a thing. Rat poison, you, if you've ever used rat poison, I don't know that we have big, massive rats in Terre Haute. Uh, New York, maybe, Brother Randy, I don't know, that's probably more Nor New York City. Um, rat poison is 99% crack corn. It's 1% poison. It's the 1% that you have to worry about. Somebody once said the greatest error is the one closest to truth. And there's a lot out there that is close to truth, but it is not truth. And so it's important for you and I as Christians that we learn to discern truth and error. As we watch a lot of things going on in the name of religion and maybe even in the name of Christ, what is truth and what is error? We'll look at that tonight, but let's first bow forward a prayer. Lord, I'd ask you to please speak to our hearts and help us from your word tonight. Lord, help us to have eyes to see, minds to understand, and hearts to receive what we see from your word tonight regarding this matter of discernment, regarding this matter of truth and error, understanding that we have a real devil out there and he does look to deceive and to pull the Christian from truth. He looks to pull the, the church into deception. And I'd ask that you please help us to understand what the Bible says about this matter. I'd ask that you please uh, be with each one of us tonight, meet the spiritual need that's in our hearts and lives. Be with Brother Gerald Clanny tonight in his church. He's a pastor of the month. I'd ask that you please bless as he preaches. Speak to their hearts as well. We ask this in Christ Jesus' name, amen. Verse 14, look at it again. He says that you henceforth be no more children. He says, be no more children. That word children, what is he talking about? He's speaking there of, of, of a term more, more like babes, babes in Christ. You know, it's okay to be a babe for a time. That's allowed for a time. But it's not okay to stay a babe. It's not okay for us to remain there. A child, when it's born into this world, is a babe for some time, but it is not okay for it to stay in that condition. If it does, something is wrong. It's okay to rely on somebody to feed you spiritually for a time. It's okay uh, to, for a time, make messes and have spiritual leadership have to come along and clean up those things. And it's okay for a time uh, where spiritual leadership has to be heavily involved to carry. That's part of being a babe. 
And certainly if you're in spiritual leadership, you understand that, and, and, and that's part of serving. But there comes a time where that should not be the case anymore, where we grow past that. There comes a time where we should move from chasing around everything that rattles to saying, here is truth, and sticking to truth. That babe in Christ might uh, grab their attention on everything that they see and it catches their eye, but when we become a solid Christian, we no longer chase everything that catches the eye. And you understand that there's truth and that there's error. Verse number 13, it tells us, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect what? Man. He says we should move from being a child to a man. From a child to a woman of God, from a child to a man of God. God wants us to be mature women and men of God, stable and grounded. Paul made this statement in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. He says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. Remember that? I understood as a child. But when I became a man, what did he do? He put away childish things. Have you put away childish things in your life, Christian? Have we moved past that infant stage? This is part of the maturing process where we begin to put away those childish things. We live in an age, I would call it, I was thinking about this afternoon, the, the Peter Pan age. You know what I'm saying? I never want to grow up. The generation or the age where the child is going to live in their parents' basement until they die. The generation where uh, people don't want to take on responsibility and they balk at commitment. The Peter Pan age. You know, spiritually, we need to grow up. I I'm, I'm not saying that to be critical tonight. I, I think we have a mature church. But we've got to look at our lives personally, too, individually, and say, am, am, I, am I mature? Uh, where, where am I at spiritually? A am I moved about by every wind of doctrine? Look at what the Bible says. One area that the Christian ought to mature in is in verse 14. Th that's in doctrine. We ought to mature in doctrine. Verse 14, he says, be no more children. Uh, don't be that infant anymore, that little babe. He says, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. He says, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. You know, the devil's very deceptive, very sly. He knows how to throw something out in front of us that looks good and debate us and then wrap us up in that lie. He knows how to make the, the lie look almost like truth. And that's what he means by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. But notice those phrases. He says, that ye henceforth be no more uh, tossed to and fro. Tossed to and fro. Uh, some of you have little ones in here. Remember those days when when the baby, you would toss that baby up into the air when it was light enough to do so? I don't know that I could do that too much more with my kids. Maybe Isaiah a little bit. They're getting, you know, they're getting too heavy anymore. But a babe you could toss around a little bit. I remember when the twins were small, and, and, and I don't know that it was my wife. It might have been one of my brothers. And, you know, you'd kind of toss them, and they think that would, was really neat. I mean, not, not ridiculously. But they, just, they, they, they like that, that, I guess, thrill. I don't know. <laughs> they seem like they liked it. He says, don't be a babe anymore that's tossed to and fro. That reminds me of the Christian that's maybe tossed from, from church to church to church. Um, where, where we don't get a grounding and say, you know what, I just need to plant myself. Or from one thing to another, spiritually, they try this and then they back off and they try that. The, the excitement wears off, and so then they look for the new exciting thing to move on to. He says, uh, we must move past the, the toss to and fro and, and get to be grounded and stable. And, and then he says this, he says, and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Remember John the Baptist, Jesus said, what went you out to see? A reed shaken in the wind. Uh, like a reed is shaken by the wind every time it blows, so is sometimes the immature Christian. That wind blows and that, that Christian is taken wherever that wind is blowing it. And some would think that uh, that wind to be the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Well, he's taking me this way and taking me that way. Notice what he says the wind is. Not the Holy Ghost, but by every wind of what? Doctrine. He's not talking about proper doctrine there. He's talking about false doctrine. We're not led in every different direction constantly like some would have to believe. One minute it's this direction, the next minute it's that. I don't think the Holy Spirit changes his mind that often. We must be careful not to be drifting about by every wind of doctrine. Uh, people want a feeling. 
They chase after many times a feeling or an experience. Not as much as what religion labels Holy Spirit led is Holy Spirit led, but can better be defined as emotionalism. And people, many times in today's day and time, look for that feeling to chase. I remember recently I was dealing with somebody. Um, they, they had made a profession of faith. They had gotten saved. And I was talking about baptism, that next step of obedience. And they said, well, how do you baptize? I told them we have a baptistry, heated, um, changing rooms in the back, towel. I mean, we got everything ready for somebody to be baptized and follow the Lord and believers' baptism. Amen. We don't store the Christmas tree in the baptistry and then have to take it out once a year. We want it ready. We want somebody to obey the Lord in that step. Um, I got done explaining baptism and how we baptize, and, and she said, well, um, I mean, can you go baptize me at a creek? I said, well, ma'am, we have a baptistry in our church. She's like, well, I'd like to be baptized in a creek. I said, can you, can you explain to me why? She says, well, that's how Jesus was baptized, and it just feels so natural, and I kind of like to you know, be a part of nature. And, and she continued to describe that. I said, ma'am, I, I think you're looking for an experience and not necessarily obedience. And I, I don't know how that's set, but that's just the honest truth. A lot of people are looking for an experience, a feeling that I can have, and not just looking to say, hey, obedience, how do I follow God? We need to develop a love for truth more than we develop a love for experience. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Get the truth, hold on to the truth, and that's, important, uh, that, that's the important thing that we have. There are many different movements, movings, and doctrines that all claim the name of Jesus Christ today. You know, you think about it. Um, who's writing here? Paul, the apostles, writing here in Ephesians. And, and even back in Paul's day, the early church, they already had heresies. They had compromises. They had cults back in Paul's day already forming from the early church. How much more today's day and time has that multiplied without number? I don't know that you could count all the compromises, the heresies, and the cults that exist in this world today. Jesus warned that in the last days, especially, there would be those that say, lo, here is Christ. Lo, there is Christ. And you know what he said? Believe him not. Not everything done in the name of Christ is of Christ. And we must have discernment. Lest we chase after this and chase after that, following whatever title a man may give upon a thing. Uh, we get into some of this teaching about warning, and sometimes people get a little bit um, concerned. Well, pastor, I, I don't know if you should label this or label that. You know one of the primary jobs of a pastor is to warn? You go over there in Acts chapter 20, and Paul says, I cease not to warn day and night for three years about the wolves. And he was talking to the elders. He said, hey, fellas, when I leave, because I'm, I'm about to check out, he said, you need to do the same. There certainly needs to be a warning. I believe that's one of the reasons that uh, many times church members and Christians are caught up in other things because there's, there's not a, a steady warning there like should be. And that falls on us as pastors. The Christian, though, is urged to develop discernment for truth and error so that he would not be tossed to and fro. That's what he's saying in Ephesians 4. He says we need to develop that discernment so that we're not tossed and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Now, there's four disciplines, and I, I say four, you could probably tell me more tonight when I get done, and that would be fine. I'm sure there are more. But as I was studying for tonight and, and looking at Scripture, I found four disciplines that I believe are very important to discern truth and error. When I say disciplines, you know what discipline means, right? What is discipline? Something that nobody likes. Whether, whether you talk about discipline in the form of correction with a child or discipline in the form of character, waking up on time, you know, discipline, uh, character in our life. Four disciplines, characters to discern between uh, truth and error. Number one, uh, we see it in our message tonight, our lesson number one, study the scriptures. If we're going to discern between truth and error, what must be done? A diligent study of scriptures. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you would. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse number 15. Brace yourself. If you've been out of school for any sake of time, this word might make you have a heart attack. Are you there? 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. What's the first word there? Study. The first thing he says is God's people must study. You right, Brother Chuck? <laughs> You know, that, that's the Christian's problem a lot of times on why we're carried about is because we remain spoon-fed. 
We never get to a point where we're eating ourselves. We're studying, we're in the Word ourselves, and as a result, we're relying on somebody to give us a spoon every day. Pastor's not there every day. Hey, young people, teenager, listen up. This is talking to you too. Mom and dad aren't always going to be there to spoon feed your Bible. You have family devotions, that's great, but what about when you get on your own? And, and he says, personally, the Christian must study. Uh, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Can I ask you, what do you think that means as far as study? What are we supposed to study? Can anyone help me out? I mean, that's a given. Now, he doesn't say study the Bible, but that's a given in understanding this, isn't it? He doesn't say study YouTube. Now, I know there's some good guys on YouTube that give uh, good thoughts, okay? I'm not against that. But do you study your Bible? He, he doesn't say study a book. We understand what this is meaning, study the Word of God. And too little study is given just simply to the Word of God. If you will discern, you must first study. School kids, every school kid in here would like an A without studying, wouldn't you? The test that you're about to have on Friday, Damon, help me out. You'd like to have an A without studying, wouldn't you? Absolutely. And many times, and, and you say, well, you know, uh, as an adult, we know that's, that's foolish, young people. You can't get an A without studying. Can I, can I ask us tonight, how many times do we assume that we're going to stand strong and stable without ever studying in the Word? Uh, study precedes that discernment. Do you know what you believe and why you believe it? The longer I pass, the more I realize so many Christians don't know what they believe and why they believe it. They sat in a church maybe for years, and they'll listen to a message, and hey, you know, that's a nice thought, but they've never really gotten in the Word of God and understood what they believe. Christians get a false, or get caught up in false doctrine and different movements that come along because they don't know their Bible. You know, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse uh, number 1, he says, try the spirits whether they be of God. What does that mean? Not every spirit is Holy Spirit. There's a, in fact, there's a lot of spirits that are out there that are not Holy Spirit. Only one Holy Spirit. I read in Jesus' day, there was a lot of unclean spirits that Christ cast out of people. Listen, there's a lot of unclean spirits out there, and we must be aware. He says, try the spirits, whether they be of God. You know what that means? Every teacher, every preacher, every evangelist ought to be examined, ought to be tried. Are they following the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures? When, when I have somebody in, I, I better do my homework and make sure that they're going back to the book, and it's the Holy Spirit on them, not some other spirit. From time to time, I'll get a voicemail on my phone. Hey, this is so-and-so I'd like to come preach for. I don't know who that is. Don't know them from Adam. I'm not inviting you. You kidding? Come invite you to our people and speak to our people, and I don't know what spirit you have. He says, try the spirits. Now, pastor protects as, as best as I can this pulpit. What a great responsibility. Now, listen. You're responsible for your ears outside of this pulpit with the YouTube, with the social media. And I'm going to hit on that just because that's so popular today. You know, we click on, I'm, I'm going to listen to something, pull up something about such and such topic, and as long as I have Bible in there or Christian in there, it should be good. But it is not. And he says, try the spirits, whether they be of God. Do they align with the Bible? I, I'm slow to buy into a thing. That's just how, I don't know if that's just by nature, but I'm slow to buy anything. I, I, I hear, I see a news feed about something, and, and uh, you know, revival or this or that. Hold on a second. Is that of God? I want to know. I'm not saying nothing's of God out there. I'm not saying we have a monopoly at Bible Baptist Church on revival or anything. But I want to know that what's going on before I buy into it, that is backed by the Holy Scriptures and backed by the Holy Spirit. You follow me? He says, try the Spirit's. God's work will never contradict God's word. Never. And do we not claim that the Bible is the final authority in all areas of faith and practice? And so I must go back to the Bible and compare everything with Scripture. What does the Scripture say? Look over in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Now, we see in the New Testament, you saw it in the Old Testament. I mean, this is just a principle by God. He says, if it doesn't line up with my word, it's not of me. Isaiah chapter 8 in verse number 20. Isaiah chapter 8, in verse number 
Uh, let's look at verse 19. We'll start there. It says, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? Verse 20, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If it's not from the book, there's not light there. Acts chapter 17, verse 11, it says about the uh, Christians, I believe it was in Berea, that they were more noble than the Christians there in Thessalonica. Why? Because they received the word, the Bible says. They received it, but then they searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things be so. You know what that tells me as a Christian? It tells me, first of all, I shouldn't be skeptical of preaching. Now, so, some people just sit there and they're skeptical. Prove it all to me. I'm not going to believe a word you say until you prove it to me. He says they received the word. And they weren't skeptics, but then they also searched the scriptures. I'm not to be skeptical of preaching. I'm to be studious about preaching. So when I hear a thing, I go back and I study. What does the Bible say? It, it's amazing. Sometimes as Christians, you know, we can see it from the Bible. I don't care what, what, what the Bible says. We already have made up in our mind what we're going to believe. They see it from Scripture, but they'll follow what they feel instead. Can I say that's more of a love for pleasure and for self than for truth? And you get over there in Timothy, and he says that's a sign of end-time apostasy. When we would rather have pleasure in self more than truth. When I see it from this book, show it to me from this book, it doesn't matter whether I agree with it or not, it's in the book. And it's settled. Stick with the book. If we'll stick with the book, we don't have to worry about being tossed about. Aren't you glad that God gave us a book where we don't have to wonder or guess? Sometimes people, well, I, I wish I lived back when God spoke audibly. I don't know how rare it was that God spoke audibly, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't like every day he just gave audible voices. When I read the Bible, that's not what I gather from it. I have a whole lot more to rely on. Get over there in Peter, and he said that. A whole lot more to rely on in Scripture today than they had back then. If I'll stick with the book. Psalm 19, let's turn over there. Psalm 19, verse 8. Look at what the Bible says about itself, about the Word of God here. He refers to it as a commandment of the Lord that's referring to the Word of God. Verse number 8, are you there? All right, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, and what does it do? It enlightens the eyes. You know what that means? When I look through this book right here, at what I'm looking at, doctrinally, philosophy-wise, movement-wise, if I look through the book, it'll enlighten my eyes and tell me exactly if that's truth or error. It enlightens the eyes. What a great book that I have. Every Christian ought to study the Word of God, and he can grow by doing so to discern truth and error. He can rightly divide. As 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, he says to rightly divide the word of truth. That phrase, rightly divide, what does that mean? That means to dissect and expound upon. You say, I'm not a preacher. There's no way that I can expound upon the word of God. He says if you study the word of God, you can properly dissect and expound upon or explain the word of God. That's not just for the preacher. I mean, that, that's dark ages stuff there where the priest kept back the Word of God and said, hey, let me explain it. I'll give it all to you. No, we live in a day where the Word of God is free to each one of us. So glad for that. Study it. Number two. Number two. We must hasten. Examine the fruit. Disciplines to discern. What are the disciplines to discern? Number two, we need to examine the fruit. It's easy to be caught up by a smooth talker. You ever get caught by the salesman? And the smooth salesman? I remember... Oh, I think I was in college. I might have been in high school. I might have been a senior in high school, somewhere around there. And I had gone to the mall to buy a Christmas present. And uh, one of those Middle Eastern ladies selling the lotions, she caught me. She tricked me. Can I see your hand? I'm like, yeah, see? And then she grabbed it and started putting something on it. By the time she got done with their smooth talking, I was buying my mother like $25 worth of material. What am I doing? The smooth talker. You know the serpent was a smooth talker? Very smooth with Eve. We've got to be careful of the smooth talker. Examine the fruit. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verse number 15. 
This is a good one here. I hope you catch it. We're not patient most of the time to examine fruit. We just kind of see something's going on and we jump into it. And he says, uh, step back. Little Brother Chavez comment here, time will tell. Anyone ever hear Brother Chavez say that before? Time will tell. It's biblical, right? Look at it. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So they look to be one thing, but they're really not. They look to be a sheep, part of the fold, but they're really not. They're ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their what? By their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth what kind of fruit? Now look at verse number 20. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. You know what God says here? God's people must watch. God's people must study, but God's people must watch as well. Examine the fruit and see if their fruit is biblical fruit. A godly work will produce a godly fruit. Let me say that one more time. A godly work will produce a godly fruit. Does their teaching promote godliness? Does their teaching promote holiness? Does their teaching promote humility? Does their teaching promote true faith? That knocks out about 90% of what's called Christianity today. Does it promote sensuality? Does it promote pride? Does it promote the flesh? Does it promote worldliness? There's a lot, even in Baptist circles today, that promotes worldliness and a casualness in this matter of Christian living and, and takes away from this matter of holiness. You know what that tells me by looking at the fruit? That's not their direction to follow. If we'll have some discernment and watch the fruit, we've got to ask ourselves by looking at the fruit, where will this lead my family? Where will this lead me? Not only should we examine teachers, we ought to, listen now, ladies, we ought to examine philosophies. There's all kinds of philosophies that constantly are coming out. Remember when evolution came out? I don't. I don't think any of you do either. I think that was all before our time. A new philosophy out there. Did you know that almost, almost, I say almost all, most, a majority of mainstream Christianity, as far as denomination goes, has accepted evolution into their doctrine where it's acceptable? That just blows my mind. How can you claim to be a Christian faith and say we accept the teaching of evolution. You just, you just denied the b very beginning of the Word of God. And, and if Genesis 1 is not correct, then why bother through Revelation? So that, that pegs it right there. Okay, examine the philosophy. What good has come from evolution? Tell me what, what fruit has been beneficial as a result of the teaching of evolution. Let me tell you the fruit of ev evolution. School shootings. Abortion. Violence. Say, how so? Because when all we are is animals, and it's okay to hunt animals, and God gave us permission to hunt animals, subdue the earth, and if that's all we are, what does it matter? It stems back to that. It's amazing. Uh, Buddhism. Buddhism is one, the number one religion to accept evolution. Look at the, well, how do you know that there's, the, the, the Christianity, uh, you, your, your version of faith is a true thing. Just begin to study and you realize real quick. Realize real quick how all these things are, 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 are false. And you see the fruit and you see which direction it leads. If Buddhism is so great and accepts evolution and it says everyone is just an animal, where does that end us up at? Well, you see, that is not the best way to go. Well, that's becoming a very popular thing today's day and time, even in Christianity, to tie Eastern mysticism and that Buddhism teaching into Christian values and blur the two. What is it? We're coming to a time where there'll be a one-world church, and you'll watch that blending occur with all Christianity, and that's what's happening in today's day and time. It doesn't matter what religion you are, we can all believe the same because we blurred it all. A Christian church, we better never blur the lines. The church is a pillar and ground of the truth. If the church blurs the lines of truth, what do we have left? Somebody must hold the ground. Galatians chapter 5, the Galatians were led away by false doctrine. Paul asked the question, he said, who did hinder you? You were led away. You know what happened? They failed, or excuse me, they followed without checking the fruit. They followed a group without checking the fruit. There's a lot out there, like I said, on YouTube and social media that you can follow and not know what the fruit is. 
There's a lot of stuff on CBN that you can follow and not know what the fruit is. I know, I just called CBN out. I don't watch it. I don't know what kind of guys are on there. But I know this. I know this. Unless I see their life, I don't know them. And so they could get on TV and say what they want. But you know what Christ told me to do? By your, their fruit, you shall know them. Do you know what their fruit is? You know, people follow the wow factor. We follow the wow factor instead of following the fruit. Oh, man, this, this wows me. Jesus said, false Christ and pro false prophets shall rise. He says, and show you signs and wonders to seduce. They're going to wow you to seduce you. You know what that tells me? I better beware. There's a lot of Christianity that's leading people away from godliness and holiness and true faith, and it's a watered-down version of the real thing. i got to ask myself, what is the fruit? What is the fruit? You cannot, cannot always see the fruit right away. Sometimes fruit takes time to produce. We're talking about that a little bit on Sunday. The tomato plant doesn't have a tomato just like that. Brother Rick, you're going to plant some seeds here pretty soon. It's going to take some time to see fruit. Are we patient enough to allow the fruit to appear and then examine it before we bite into it? The first time something shows up on the scene, do we jump in and take a bite? Hey, this must be it. Or do we examine and watch? And see, our problem is we rush into everything so quick. Wherefore, by your fruits, ye shall know them. There was a church up in the Chicago area, the suburbs up there, and uh, it's called the, the Willow Creek Church. And the Willow Creek Church has been around since, I think, 1975. A man by the name of Bill Heibel started the church. Anyone ever hear of it? Okay, a few of you. It's a mega church. Um, currently, it runs 18,000 on the weekend. 18,000. Can you imagine? I can't even imagine that in a church. That's huge. Um, at, at its peak, it ran 25,000. That's a lot of people. The pastor, Bill Hybels, who was there for decades. You know what he said after decades of being there? We've grown in numbers, but we failed to see transformed lives. A mile wide, an inch deep. Got a bunch of people in a pew, but what has it done for them? You know what he finally, after four decades of ministering at a place, realized? Our fruit's not there. How sad it would be to follow after something for decades and then realize later, you know what? It doesn't have the fruit that I'm looking for. Examine the fruit before you follow. What is it going to produce? People follow a trend so many times. They follow the crowd. Oh, the, the contemporary way is where it's at. Look at Everyone's going that way and everyone's flocking to that. It's growing. Growth means godliness. The deer on the side of the road that gets hit by a car in the summertime, it grows too overnight. But that's called bloating. And eventually it bursts open. You're seeing that a lot today's day and time, aren't you? Be careful about just following the crowd. You know what the tried and proven way is? Look at their fruit. It goes all the way back to the early church. If we'll follow that fruit. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. We'll end it here. At least I got five minutes. We'll see where we can end it. 2 Timothy 2, verse 3. Second Timothy. Excuse me, I'm not sure what I said, but 3, verse 13. It says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's going to get worse and worse, he's saying, about this matter of deception. But then what does he say? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Notice that is past tense. The things that thou hast learned. You've already learned these things and hast been assured of. The things that Timothy was taught by his mother and his grandmother. That he learned from a child, from the word of God. Notice what he says. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You know what he said? You've seen the lives of those that taught you that stuff. You've seen the fruit. And stick with it. Follow those that you can see their fruit. And know it is good fruit. Let me say number three. I got four minutes. Number three, identify criticism. Identify criticism. Disciplines uh, to discern. What is another discipline to discern? Second Peter chapter two, verse number one. Can we turn there quickly? Second Peter chapter two and verse number one. What is this third discipline? God's people must listen. They must listen. They must study. They must watch and they must listen. Second Peter chapter two, verse one. It says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, 
even denying the Lord that bought them and bring, them, uh, uh, bring upon themselves switch, uh, swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Notice what it says now. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Listen to this one. The way of error will always be critical of truth. When someone speaks or something speaks of evil about the way of truth, you know it's coming from the way of error. What do you mean, pastor? A preacher or teacher can say a lot of good things and then wittingly sneak in that one derogatory mark from the truth of God. And that's not by accident or coincidence. He knows what he's doing. Once again, the rat poison is 99% crack corn, but 1% poison. It's that one comment attacking the King James Bible. It's, it's that one comment attacking separation or attacking creation or attacking so on. I mean, the, the basic truths of God's word. Red flag goes up in my mind when I hear a lot of good things, but then I hear attack. There's a difference between ignorance and evil, too. We had a preacher one time, he was preaching, and he made the statement, he says, I, I cannot say whether the King James Bible is a word perfect in every word Bible. He made a statement out of ignorance. He wasn't attacking it, he, just, he, he wasn't well studied in that area, and he made that statement. And I came up, I said, we do have an every word Bible. The Bible says it's an every word Bible. Now, he wasn't attacking the word of God. There's a difference between ignorance and evil. There's a difference between that and a preacher that will get up and attack the King James Bible. I remember talking to a man that started coming to church here, and he came from another church, and he, he said, my pastor tells us to stay away from the King James Bible. There's just something evil about that. There might be a lot of good things about that guy, but I'm staying away from that direction. Identify criticism. We need to listen. God's work never condemns God's precepts. There's a difference, I, I mentioned that. Romans chapter 16, we don't have time to turn there. 17 and 18 talks about divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. When truth is condemned, watch out. When truth is condemned, watch out. You know, sometimes it's not listening for what they condemn. Sometimes it's listening for what they don't say. What are they leaving out on purpose and why? You got to listen. The last one, it's 8 o'clock. Pray for discernment. If any man lack wisdom, what should he do? Ask a God. Don't rely on a feeling. I know the Holy Spirit does speak and he does direct. But I think too many times Christians rely on a feeling. I just felt something about that. Be careful about just feeling things. Ask God to show you. To show you truth. I felt a lot of things before too. I, one time I stuck my hand in the shot socket and I felt that. We, we get feelings, and I understand the Holy Spirit does lay on the heart. But a lot of times, the Christian uses that excuse of, I just have a feeling, when God has not laid it out. Make sure you know a thing. Ask God for that discernment. There's a lot of deception, a lot of heresy, a lot of compromise today. And I wish I could say that in a Bible-preaching, Bible-believing church, that nobody ever gets sucked out by the heresies, the compromises, and the cults but that would be untrue to say. Christian, what does that mean for you and I? We need to be disciplined to be able to discern truth and error, to stay on the straight and narrow. As we get closer to the Christ's return, it's going to get worse and worse. You're going to see more of that going on. I need to stick to truth in my life. And it's going to take some discipline to study, to listen, to watch, and to pray. God, help me to know discernment between truth and error. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe tonight you don't know Christ as your Savior. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, there's never been a time where you've been born again. Jesus Christ loves you and he died on the cross for you. That's the ultimate truth right there, the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he did all that to pay for your sins, to pay for my sins. And he offers that forgiveness in a home in heaven. Maybe you're here tonight and there's never been a time where you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I would hope that you would come during this invitation time and let us take a Bible and show you how you could be saved tonight. Lord, I'd ask you to please bless invitation time. I'd ask that people would respond according to how you've spoken to our hearts. And if there is one here without Christ tonight, may they be saved. We ask all this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as the music begins to play. God spoke to your heart. The altar's open for us tonight.
Once again, if you're here, you don't know Christ as your Savior, you need to be saved tonight. We have a pastor at the front of the aisle. You come take his hand, let him know why you come today. Let him know that you need Christ.